there is no point in using levels. I know a lot of you will disagree with me and after a thousand steps into your work, you realize, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? Hi there, this is Unmesh from Piximperfect. How are you doing? I hope you're having a great day and making it an incredible one. This discussion is going to be a bit heated since we are talking about 10 Photoshop features which you must never use. These features are either outdated, doesn't make sense or have a way better alternative. And again, it is okay to disagree absolutely fine and you should disagree and that's how a creative community thrives. Keep in mind these are my opinions and I would like to hear from you whether you agree or not or whether there's something that you find useless. So let's get started. Back in the magical world of Photoshop and if you wish to go ahead and download any of the photos and follow along, you know what to do. Check the links in the description. The first crazy tool that doesn't make sense anymore is the sharpen tool which you'll find right here in the blur tool group. Blur tool, sharpen tool, smudge tool, all in the same group. All of them are useful except the sharpen tool. If you select that, it does sharpen the image. Let us paint over the eyes. Let's say you want to sharpen the eyes. It does sharpen the eyes and does do a pretty good job. but that's it. You don't have any more controls and the worst part is it is destructive. It's done. You cannot dial down the sharpening. You cannot change the way it sharpens. And let's say you went a bit extreme and you sharpened it way too much. And after a thousand steps into your work, you realize, oh my gosh, what was I thinking? And you cannot dial it back down. A much better way, let's go back to how it was. So we're going to go to history, set it to how it was. A better way, of course, is using the high pass technique or simply make a copy of the background layer by pressing Ctrl or Command J. Go to filter, convert for smart filter so that whatever filter we apply, we can change the values later. Now let's go to filter, sharpen and smart sharpen. There you go. And right in here, you can use as much sharpening as you need. I recommend increasing the amount all the way to 500 and then slowly and gradually play with the radius and stop at the point where you see the halos. So I'm going to slowly and gradually increase the radius. And beyond this point, it is starting to add some halos. So be careful of that. So I guess 2.4 is fine. You can also reduce the noise if you wish to. And this is great. And of course, the amount is way too much. So let us go a little lower, maybe about 200%. Hit OK. And you can have it only in the areas where you want it. Very selective. So you can use the mask right here or create a mask of this layer. That's up to you. If you want to select this mask that comes with smart filters, you can select that, press Ctrl or Command I, take the brush, white as the foreground color, only paint on the areas where you do need the sharpening. You also want to make sure flow and opacity are higher. There you go. Let's say I want sharpening here, here and on the lips. And at any point in time, you can always double click right here on the smart filter, in this case, smart sharpen, and you can reduce the amount or increase the amount. That's up to you. Much more flexible than just using the sharpen tool. The second useless tool right now, which used to make a lot of sense before, is the dodge and the burn tool. I know there's going to be a lot of you who disagree with this and that's fine. If there's something that works for you, works perfect for you, that is the best tool for you. What my argument is, is let's say you want to dodge this eye bag away. Instead of selecting the dodge tool, controlling the exposure to about let's say 20% and trying to kind of take that away by painting over it. It works, but it's destructive and there is no way you can go back. You're just stuck. And also in a sense, it is very limited. If I were to zoom in, increase the exposure all the way to 100. And if I do this, did you notice something? Even though I'm painting at the same place over and over again, the exposure in that area is just stuck. Unless and until you pick up your pen or mouse and paint again, it wouldn't be brightened further. There are just so many better ways to do it. You can do it with blend modes, you can do it with curves. Let me share with you one easy way. All I have to do is to create a brand new layer by clicking on this button. Change the blend mode of this layer from normal to soft light. Take the brush, set the foreground and the background color to black and white, which are the defaults. If it's not already, if it's a weird color, press D to set them to defaults. Now with the brush, flow at about 1 or 2%. I'm going to set it to 1%. Just paint white or black to dodge or burn. That's all. So I'm going to paint this area in white. Let's do that. And then we're going to paint this shiny area in black. By the way, I'm changing colors by simply pressing X to toggle between the foreground and the background colors. That's all. And just by doing this, here's the before 
he has the after so beautifully and so naturally gone. Now the great advantage is this is on a separate layer. You can always turn it off and on. You can decrease the opacity if you think it is too much. You can keep it natural. You can always paint and change stuff. The possibilities are just limitless. You can also create curves, one for dodging and one for burning. And then you can even change their intensity depending upon if you want more or less. So many better ways to do it than using the dodge or burn tool which are very, very destructive. The third useless tool award goes to the sponge tool. It never made sense to me. Has it ever made sense to you? Maybe in the earlier versions of Photoshop, but right now, I don't just know. I'm not sure. You'll find the sponge tool right inside the same dodge and burn group. They say birds of a feather flock together. And all it does is saturates or desaturates. That's all. So let's say you wanted to increase the saturation right here. Make sure the mode is set to saturate. You can change the amount of flow and then just paint over it to saturate. And let's say you want to desaturate these areas. Choose desaturate and just paint over that. That's all. But again, this is destructive. There is no way you can go back. A much better way, of course, is using adjustment layers. So let's go back to how it was. You can use a hue saturation adjustment layer. You can use vibrance adjustment layer. Up to you. If you were to use something like hue saturation, click on the adjustment layer icon and then choose hue saturation. And then let's say I want to increase the saturation right here a little bit. Just do that. And you can adjust this at any time and you have so many more controls. You can increase just the reds, just the yellows, just the greens. You can specifically target the shade of color that you want to increase the saturation of. There are so many options. Let's say I just want to increase the saturation. And then again, I want to limit it to just this area. Simple. Select the mask, press Ctrl or Command I. And with white as the foreground color and with the brush tool selected, increase the flow. Just paint where you want to have the effect of it. That is all. And if this feels like a long process to you, in the brand new version of Photoshop, you can use the brand new adjustment brush tool. Just select that, choose whatever you want. Let's say I want to use hue saturation. That's what we were talking about. And just paint over the area where you want to increase the saturation. That's it. And the controls will show up right here. Before we move on to the next one, you know what is not useless? coming to my next live in-person workshop. So I'm doing a two-day, full-day, complete Photoshop workshop in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, for the Carolina Photo Expo. We're gonna cover everything that a photographer needs to know about Photoshop, from intermediate techniques to advanced techniques and beyond. Right from the fundamental concepts on color grading, retouching and compositing, to high-end techniques on day two, to even the latest technologies and AI in the world of Photoshop and photography. It's gonna be a hell of a ride learning Photoshop together. We will ask questions, follow along together, and and just have a fantastic time and wonderful conversations. I really hope you can make it and if you're interested to know what is included or register, check the links in the description. All right, the next one is going to be heavily, heavily controversial, but I'm going to fight my way in the court if I have to. And that is levels. There is no point in using levels. I know a lot of you will disagree with me and that is absolutely fine. If levels works for you and gets the job done, it is the best tool for you. But hear me out. Here are my points. Everything that levels can do, curves can do, and a bit more, so why use levels? So if I were to create a levels adjustment layer like this, if I take the slider on the left to the right, it's gonna make the dark areas darker. Similarly, if I were to create a curves adjustment layer, take the slider on the left to the right, it's gonna make the darks darker. If I go back to levels, move this slider right here, it's gonna make the bright areas brighter. Similarly with curves, it does the exact same thing. On top of that, if you take the middle slider to the right, it is simply like creating a point inside of the curves and just taking it down, just like that. And similarly, if you take it to the left, now this is a bit different in curves and a bit better actually. So right in here, it's also fading it and brightening the shadows. But with curves, if you create a point and take it up, it just brightens everything but doesn't fade it. But if you want the same effect, you can just take this point right here up and it will create the exact same effect. On top of that, if you look at the eyedroppers inside of it, you have the same three eyedroppers, black point, white point, gray point right here. Similarly right here, you have black point, white point, gray point. Same as that. You can choose any one of these and click on an area that should have been neutral, like the eye right here, and it tries to correct that anyway. Similarly, you'll find the same with levels. Let us reset it. Now here's one more thing. There are other sliders that exactly match. So if you go to levels, this slider right here, if you take it to the right, if you take it all the way to the right, it's going to make it white. If you take this one to the left, it's going to add black, right? Similarly with curves, if you take this point on the right, 
down, it's going to add black. And if you take this point on the left up, it's going to add white. And you can do so much more with curves. So these are the things that levels can do. And the curves can also do. You have different red, green and blue channels. Similarly with levels, you have the same red, green and blue channels. On top of that, what curves can do extra, you can specifically target different areas more precisely. So if you want to brighten up this specific brightness level, you can just create a point, take it up. You can just create a point, take it down. And it becomes way more simpler if we reset that and use the hand right here. If you click on the hand, let's say I want to brighten this level, click and drag it up. That's all. And let's say you want to darken this level, click and drag it down. That's all. It automatically plots the point and adjusts it for you. So much more simpler, so much more precise. And also at this point, if you think that these areas are getting way too bright, you can just click and drag it down right here. And then if something doesn't feel right, you can also adjust it right here. Pinpoint and adjust. So everything that levels can do, curves can do, and so much more and so much better. So why not just use curves? Again, that was just my argument. If levels works for you, if it fits your workflow, if you find it easy, go for it. It is the best tool for you and for your workflow. The next feature that you should avoid using are the 3D features in Photoshop. Unfortunately, Adobe is discontinuing 3D features inside of Photoshop. And because of that, if you try to use that in the later versions of Photoshop, Photoshop is likely to crash and the 3D features are not going to work out. I remember creating such wonderful lessons with it like using 3D to create reflections and then again using 3D to create long shadows. Unfortunately, we cannot do that anymore. And if we try to, things are not going to work out in our favor and maybe Photoshop will crash too. So if you have been using Photoshop for a while, you would notice this. If you go to Window, Workspace, you wouldn't find 3D anymore. Earlier, we used to have a 3D workspace. So 3D features are unfortunately going away and being sold separately as a separate Adobe application. Right in here, you can see the article of Photoshop's 3D features going away. And earlier, at least we had Adobe Dimension, which was a part of the Creative Cloud subscription. But right now, you have to buy Adobe Substance and all of that separately, which is crazy. But anyway, it is the way it is. <laughs> And that's all. The next one is a bit crazy. I don't know what is the use case of this. Maybe you can create some pixel level pattern. But either way, it is the single column, row or marquee tool. All it does is that it selects a single row of pixels or a single column of pixels. So let's say we choose single row marquee tool. And if we click, it's just going to select a single row of pixels. <laughs> that is all. Let's press Control or Command D. If you choose the single column marquee tool, click, it's just going to select a single column. It has very limited use case. Some people may argue that you can create borders with it. Maybe sometimes you need thin borders, but then again, you can just press Control or Command A and then go to Edit, Stroke. And you can simply create a border of just one pixel. You can keep it inside and hit OK. Press Control or Command D. And if you zoom in, you have a black thin border. You can make it as thick as you want. You can keep it one pixel. So why do you really need that? The next one used to make sense. I used to use it sometime, but not anymore. And that is the auto color, auto contrast, and auto something tone. Let us try that on this image. So this photo is a bit greenish. Let's say you want to adjust the tone automatically. Let's try that. Let's go to image, auto tone. Uh, this is not what we were looking for. And the worst part is, this is destructive. Let's say you go forward with this. There is no way you can adjust this. Let's say you're somewhat happy with it, not completely happy with it. Again, there is no adjustment scope right here. You're stuck. Let's go back to how it was. Let us try again. Let's go to image, auto color this time. It is better, but it's also making the image very, very dark. It's crushing the details. Let's go back. A much better way is to just use curves. Uh, you know, curves is my favorite and it's auto settings. So simply click on the adjustment layer icon and then choose curves and then click on this grid right there. Choose auto options and you have loads of options right here. Choose what you like. You can just simply enhance the brightness and contrast or find dark and light colors out of these three choose what you like, and you can also check snap neutral midtones. That way it removes the green color cast as well. So out of these three, let's say you like this one and just hit OK. The best part, you can adjust it. If you feel that this is too dark, you can just balance it out inside of the RGB channel. If you feel like you need to brighten up this area, with the help of the hand, click and drag it up like so. You just have so many options right here. Everything is adjustable. Now that I think about it, I've made it too bright, so I'm going to make it slightly darker. Similarly, let's have a look at this image. 
I feel that we can add a bit of punch right here. So if we go to image, auto contrast, it does nothing. Instead, if you click on the adjustment layer icon and then choose curves and go back to auto options here, all I want to do is to enhance the brightness and contrast, make sure this is selected, hit OK, and it's done instantly. Here's the before and here's the after, and everything is adjustable. The next feature is something that you ask yourself, why does that even exist when there is a feature so much better than this? And that is blurring and sharpening in weird ways. So let us make a copy of the background layer. You can go to filter, blur, and then you have blur. Uh, why would you choose that? If we click on it, there is no control. There is nothing and it just slightly blurs it. Here's the before, here's the after. You cannot even tell. Here's the before, here's the after. I don't know why it is there. Let's try again. Go to filter, blur, blur. It blurs it even more. Let's go to filter, blur, blur. It blurs it even more. You can just repeat it with the previous filter and it just keeps on blurring every time you apply it. Why use it when you have something like Gaussian blur where you have the control to apply it at whatever level you want? You can even automate that process if that is the thing here. Some people might argue maybe it's useful for actions, maybe it's useful for automation. You can use Gaussian blur for that. Heck, you even have advanced things like blur gallery and inside of it, you can go to field blur which is so much more advanced and with that, you can select this area and you can have no blur right here. And then you can select an area in the background and you can have more blur right there. And then you can select another area with a lot more blur. And then you can select this area with little blur. So with so many controls, I don't see any sense for having something like filter, blur and blur. And then you have blur more. So if you zoom in, filter, blur and then blur more it blurs a little bit more. And it doesn't stop here. We already covered Smart Sharpen where we can control the values later. Of course, I recommend converting this layer into a smart object by going to Filter, Convert for Smart Filters. Now this layer is a smart object so that you can change the values later. Now if you go to Filter, Sharpen, and then you have Sharpen. Why? And Sharpen More. You can select that. It sharpens it a bit but you have no control. If you try to double click right here, nothing is gonna show up. Let us delete that. And then you have filter, sharpen, sharpen more, and it sharpens a bit more, adds a lot of noise. There is no control of the radius. There is no control to reduce the noise. I don't know why this exists. If you know, please enlighten me in the comments. Now I've created a video on this too. A lot of you watched it and it worked great. It still works the same way. And that is the problem. There are so many better alternatives which are non-destructive. That too was destructive. And that is the background eraser too. Let us select that. Let me show you what it does. So let's say you want to erase the background. You can choose discontiguous or contiguous. So if you choose contiguous and let us try to remove the background right here. It's not going to go inside of the hair, right? If you choose discontiguous, it will try to go inside as well. So let's go back to how it was. See? and it does a pretty good job of removing the background. But keep in mind that this is destructive and sometimes it misses, actually a lot of times it misses. There you go. So that is how it removes the background. And as you can see, it's not bad. It does a pretty good job, but you have to paint all over the subject and sometimes it can miss, sometimes even in this area, it can miss a little bit. But with the later versions of Photoshop, select subject has become so much better that you don't really need it. Plus, this is destructive. Select any of these three tools, the object selection, quick selection, or the magic wand, and click on select subject. And there you go. It does a fantastic job, even with the hair. And then click on the mask button. There you go, done. And if you want finer controls, let's go back to how it was. I recommend clicking on select and mask, and then click on select subject done and then you have way more controls for example for the hair we can change the view to on white so that we can see what is happening and then you can try color aware or object aware whichever works better for you for this example let's go with color aware and then with the refine edge brush tool right here you can even refine it further and this is just fantastic there you have it wonderful isn't it Welcome to the finale and the last one of the useless tools is the magnetic lasso tool. And I used to love it when I was introduced to Photoshop probably when I was 8 or 9 years old. And this one was 
pretty darn fantastic because using the lasso tool and back then I had a mouse and just that. It was very difficult to kind of make a selection of this and I was too young and too impatient to learn and use the pen tool. So I would always use the magnetic lasso tool and start right here. It automatically tried to find the edges and this was magic at the time. The only problem was you can sometimes go a little out of the area and then you get back right here. Then you have to stick with it. There is no way I can let go. I have to finish the selection once I have just activated it. Of course, you can press the backspace or the delete key to kind of delete some of these points. Like so, but it's still um, a hassle. And you have to just navigate through and select one by one and some things wouldn't be right. And right now there are just way better tools that automatically detect the edges. For example, the quick selection tool. Let us select the quick selection tool and all you do, you can try select subject, click on that and that's pretty much done. If you don't like it, press Control or command D and then you can select it yourself. That is also possible. You can also use something like the object selection tool. And right now the object finder is checked and you can even hover over it to select these objects separately. So if you click on the cup, it automatically selects the cup. If you want to add the saucer to it, hold the shift key and click on it and it adds that. And this is just incredible out of this world, amazing. Adobe, I have to give huge credits to you for this. So those were the 10 tools and features which you should not use in Photoshop, of course, according to my opinion. Either they are outdated, doesn't make sense, or there are just so many better alternatives. And do let me know what are some other features that you find weird that people still use. I hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, make sure to give us a like and also don't forget to subscribe and not just subscribe. Ring the bell so that you my friend don't miss any other future tips, tricks or tutorials. I would like to take this moment to thank all of these nice and amazing people for supporting Piximperfect on Patreon. And when you do support Piximperfect on Patreon, there are some perks as well. So check out our Patreon page right here. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in my next one. Till then, stay tuned and make sure that you keep creating. Lucky, lucky, lucky me. Uh -oh.